Hello and welcome to Crushing Classical. I'm Tracy Friedlander and today I'm interviewing Susie Perlman who is a violinist, freelancer in New York City and I want to talk to her today because she had a career of thriving career as a violinist in an orchestra or two, I'm not sure I'm going to find out right now, and um, decided to instead move to a New York City and create a different kind of career so that she could live in New York City. So I want to find out all about that right now and get to it. So welcome, Susie. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. How are you? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day today. Awesome. So how would you describe yourself to me in one sentence? I am a person who loves my family and friends, uh, loves the violin and playing music. Um, I love Jewish culture. I love excitement. And I love New York City. That's awesome. So why did you move to New York? I was obsessed with New York from a young age. Um, I think it's the most exciting place on earth. I think it's incredible how we all live on top of each other here and get along. Um, people work really hard here, crazy amounts of hours, and I think that's a very attractive quality in a person. And yeah, uh, so you, David told my husband, David is how I know you through, um, he was a colleague of yours in the San Antonio Symphony. And so that's where you guys met. And so um, he told me that you left the San Antonio Symphony for the New York life. Is that what happened? Yes, that's exactly right. I loved my life in San Antonio for the five years that I was there, but I always felt a little bit like a fish out of water. Can mm -hmm. you tell from Philadelphia? I pronounced the word water, water. Anyway, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I never felt quite at home there. So when I was eligible for a sabbatical, I took it, and I knew that I wouldn't return if things were working for me. Uh-huh. So that's nice. So you were able to leave without completely quitting with nothing going on yet. So you were able to try it out, essentially. Yes, I had a security blanket while leaving. That's good. So did you, and I know that you did um, Phantom, was Phantom your for, your first break in, so to speak, and the musical thing? Did you know you were um, going to do musicals in New York? Or how well, did how did that I, all come about? Okay, I hoped right after San Antonio to move to New York and immediately get into this variety of gigs, uh, which I'm in. But it didn't happen immediately. I put the word out that I was going to head to New York and didn't really have much connection there exactly. Um, and out of the blue, someone said to me, a friend of theirs was in the Phantom of the Opera tour orchestra, and they were looking for a concert master. Would I be interested? And I said, well, well I never thought about that touring. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why not? I, I'm planning on going to New York and I don't have any connections and these might be some connections and this is a, a cool transition period in my life anyway. Traveling would be fun. Um, so I did audition for that and I did take it and went on the road for two years. And in that two years, I did meet some New York people that heavily influenced my life once I moved to New York. Oh, so it wasn't totally connected like the Phantom. It wasn't the same Phantom group from Broadway as it was on the touring Phantom. It was, just happened to be some New Yorkers in there that helped you kind of break um, in? Well, there is actually a Phantom still on Broadway from the original 1986. Um, wow. <laughs> and uh, actually, it opened in 1988, I believe, um, in New York, 1986 in England. Um, and so that group is still on Broadway and didn't leave. Um, however, the supervisors for that group and almost all tours of the Phantom of the Opera are the same people. And so not the same people in the production, but the same people supervising it. Oh, um, I see. Yeah. So those are the ones I met on the road. So what was that like? You probably, I'm wondering, 
you know, you were on sabbatical for, from San Antonio, but you knew that you were passionate about living in New York. So what, did, what was that like emotionally that year while you were off just hoping and really wanting it to work out so that you could move there? What was that like? Well, that one year of leave from San Antonio turned into three. Um, okay. Lucky for me, San Antonio was having some money problems at the time. And in order to keep its musicians, it granted up to three years of leave uh, instead mm-hmm. of just the one. So I did take my one year sabbatical, but then after that, I took two more years. Um, because I could. (laughs) So I spent two years on the road and then I did my first year in New York. And when I saw that it was going well and I had to answer to San Antonio, I told them, okay, I'm ready to, uh, leave the orchestra permanently. So what was it like emotionally? You know, the entire time that I was not, not so much on the road because I didn't have a sense of my New York life when I was on the road, but Mm -hmm. The entire time I did have a sense of my New York life, I knew that this was the life for me and there was really no question in my mind. Uh, So it felt right. It felt like I was doing exactly what I wanted and I was more than ready to tell San Antonio when I had to that this is the place for me. You know, and what I love about that so much, Susie, is that so often as classical musicians, we go out into the world, into the audition scene. And I think I'm speaking for how I felt. And also I think what other people have told me that they feel like they don't have a choice in where they live. You know, they just are going to go wherever the jobs are. And you knew that New York City was the place for you and that you had to make that happen and you did it. So that's that's just what's so inspiring about you because because Thanks. New York is an exciting place to live. I mean, look at it. It's on every single movie and TV show that there's a reason for that. You know? <laughs> um, I mean, there is also, of course, truth to musicians making the best of wherever they get the job and learning yeah. to live in that place. And, it, and most musicians do do that, uh, you know, when they win a big job. Um, yeah. Cleveland isn't the most... Uh, attractive place to the average person. But if somebody wins a job in the Cleveland Orchestra, they make Cleveland their life and they learn to love it. Um, or, right. or they, I mean, sometimes you don't have to learn to love it. I, I lived in Cleveland for a while and I did love it. Um, but um, sometimes the place trumps the job. And as much as I loved my job in San Antonio, and San Antonio is not a bad place. Um, right. It, the place meant the world to me. New York City is the place. And you knew that about yourself. I did. Which is great. Yeah. So um, I saw that you have an organization called Concerts in Motion. Is that something you started? And what is that? I helped to start it, but I was not the very first person. My friend Jennifer, who's now my boss, (laughs) um, (laughs) is actually the first person to start it. And then I I came in pretty early on. It's nine years old at this point, and it is a charity. It's a 501c3 that brings live music free of charge to people who have trouble getting to concerts, which Mm -hmm. usually means the sick or the elderly or the disabled um, or the isolated in, in some way. And we bring them music either to their bedroom if they can't get out of bed uh, to their common room, if they can make it to the common room, but they really can't leave their building, to mm-hmm. their hospital room, um, to wherever we can reach people who are in need. That's great. That's really nice. So I am sure people are just so grateful. What was the inspiration of, of that organization, starting that organization? Yeah. Well, um, my friend Jennifer was in the opera world. She's a coloratura soprano. And when she had operas to perform, she would take her major arias and sing them through at a nursing home and decided that she got so much more satisfaction singing for these people in need rather than for people paying 
top dollar for the tickets in the opera halls. So she decided that she would start doing it. And it started with just her going around to a few sick people, a few elderly people, bedridden. And it skyrocketed from that. And now the organization, and we're only in New York City, uh, Mm -hmm. we perform 750 concerts a year. Wow. Um, And, you know, sometimes that could be one person playing a serenade for one person. That counts as a concert. Or sometimes it's a a band of three playing for a room of 750 uh, Chinese seniors celebrating the Chinese New Year. Every circumstance is different in Concerts in Motion. If you've seen if you've seen one, you've seen one. Um, <laughs> yeah, everything is different. Is that your motto? If you've seen um, one, you've seen one. Um, it's not, but it should be. <laughs> <laughs> That's so inspiring. So you created with your friend, and she, you guys are working together to bring something new that doesn't exist already, which is so great. You know, especially it's. You know, like you said at the very beginning, New Yorkers living on top of each other. I mean, you're taking care of each other. We are with, with we are. what you do. That's awesome. Yes, exactly. It's it's very satisfying. So, what's the craziest New York gig story you have? Um, I kind of have two that are in the same vein. Um, once I tell the first, the second is almost identical, so it's not as exciting. But I'll tell you both anyway. <laughs> favorite one was um, a man wanted to propose to his girlfriend on the train that they met on, which was the Q train. And one person led to another person to another person to me. And I ended up getting the call for this. And he wanted a violinist to serenade as he dropped down to one knee and proposed. Oh my gosh. This to happen on a moving train. Um, So I told him, I, I'm going to, you know, bring my not as great violin and I will do it as long as I can get a seat because I can't perform while no. needing. Yeah, I, I can't perform without at least one hand free or one leg free to hold a pole. Um, <laughs> anyway, we agreed and he hired a photographer as well. And sure enough, we at, at the exact stop that he wanted um, this was a surprise, of course, to his girlfriend. She didn't know who we were. Um, when I started unpacking my violin on the subway, she thought I was a normal street musician. Um, but when he got down on one knee and we got right next to him, the photographer started snapping. I started playing and she started screaming. <laughs> she said, yes, the whole train clapped. We got out at the next stop, took some pictures and remained friends on Facebook. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love it. Yes. So the other one was similar. It was just outside in front of the love statue on Sixth Avenue. And I was freezing for that one. It was in March and I had to wear a winter coat while I was playing outside. Um, but similar. He got down. She said yes. And we took pictures. <laughs> That's so great. Well, now you're going to be known as the violinist that anyone should call if they're going to propose to their girlfriend, right? (laughs) Well, I certainly do things for the fun of it. And neither of those were high paying ones. But I was so happy to do them that I just I, I set a very reasonable price. They agreed we did it. And I have the story to tell and that's worth it to me. And I'm I'm glad these people are happy. That's so awesome. Well, okay, so every interview that I do on this podcast, I ask this question and and I have to preempt it with the fact that you're such a positive person that I don't know if you'll actually um, have one of these, <laughs> but on the show, I have a thing called a fuck this moment where I ask people where in their adult life and career where they're at a crossroads and they were like, I, I can either go the easy, comfortable, safe route, and maybe not be doing exactly what I want, or I can choose the unknown route. And it's scary. And it's unknown. And fuck this, I'm going to do it anyway. Do you have a moment like that where where you felt really like that it was definitive in your mind that you chose that? I would say the moment I chose to leave the San Antonio Symphony on sabbatical 
Um, I did have that cushion of sabbatical, but it was kind of a, let me leave this nicely paying, comfortable job where I'm appreciated to going into the unknown of New York City, um, which could have resulted in me getting here and not having enough to do and selling swatch watches. Uh, I was, I was open to that. I like swatches. I also like shoes. I thought, you know, if I don't get enough music work, I could maybe sell shoes or swatches. Um, I love teaching also. So I knew that that was possible. Um, so I, I was essentially saying, fuck this to a comfy job knowing that I could come back to it. So I guess it, I wasn't, it was like half fuck this job. Um, <laughs> so a, a little bit, um, but you know, it wasn't as daring a situation as say, if I didn't have the sabbatical and if I didn't have the Phantom of the Opera job in the middle. Um, so I guess it's kind of close, but not, a, not exactly. Because um, once I did really say fuck this job to San Antonio three years later, I had an incredible fucking job in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so not exactly. I'm, I'm lucky that things like lined up nicely so far for me in that yeah. area. Yeah. What was that like to be on the road for two whole years? It was, well, to be fair, it was one year and nine months. Um, okay, but close That's enough. two. Um, That's two. <laughs> yeah. um, it was like being on another planet. Um, another planet made of money, that is. I made so much money. But. Oh, my gosh. Uh, there was no flexibility at all. So going to friends' weddings, going to holidays with the family, uh, taking a vacation, those were all out of the question. Um, in order to get a two week paid, vac- not paid <laughs> a two week vacation, I had to be on for one full year and not miss any shows. And then they said, okay, you can have two weeks, but you have to take them in a row and you won't get them for another year. So decide when, <laughs> and, and then I did revolve it around a friend's wedding. Um, but it was absolutely, um, like stifling in that way. I, I like to think like, like most people that, um, when a big deal happens, I stop what I'm doing and I go and you can't do that when you're on tour. You can't, right. um, you know, wa- watch your friend celebrate her new baby. You can't, you know, you are obligated. Um, so the rigidity of that was, was an- enough to drive at least me, crazy, um, to not go more than two years. Um, that said, it was fabulous. It was <laughs> free days. I, I had so much free time. I took everything that was on the back burner in my life. I wanted to learn Brahms concerto. I wanted to learn the Bach C major sonata. I wanted to start running again. I wanted to visit amusement parks. Um, I wanted to, um, check out all the museums in every new city. And, and I did all of that. It's really time to get what you've always been meaning to do or take your favorite things and just do them because you actually have the time to do them. Um, so I loved that. I loved the feeling of not being rooted. I had no home anywhere. I sold all my furniture. I didn't have a home uh, except for where I was at the time. Um, cool. and yeah, it was wild. I mean, who does yeah. Um, I did it and I loved it. And the only constant that you have in each city are the people that you work with. And I loved these people. I still love these people. I get together with them frequently. A lot of us are in New York or around New York or certainly visit New York. Um, and it was an experience of a lifetime. And I came home with that chunk of money, my, my new home that is, and I bought a home. Um, And so I can thank Phantom of the Opera for my first home in New York City, my first home that I purchased. And um, you bought a home. Yeah. And you you know, everyone knows or most people know that buying something in New York is not like buying something in Poughkeepsie, (laughs) 
<laughs> well, you know, the Kipsy isn't too far away, and it's probably expensive there too. But yeah, <laughs> okay, that's a bad example. <laughs> um, but yeah, like Middle America is not the same as. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'll never forget my first apartment was. Um, I mean, really, by New York standards, I thought it was pretty big, but it was about 474 square feet, give or take. Um, (laughs) That was the measurement from my super. Anyway, um, and my mom came to look at it for the first time, and we walked in, and she goes, is that it? And I said, Mom, yes, that's it. It's big. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Um, So, you know, we... We really do live in small places, and it's kind of amazing to see what people do with those small places. It's yeah. Fine. I remember the first time I saw a true New York kitchen, and I was like, I get why everyone eats out here, because there's like, <laughs> you know, your kitchen is like 12 inches by 12 inches, you know? <laughs> it's true. Some elevators are bigger. Most elevators are bigger than my kitchen. <laughs> But um, whatever. You're right. We do eat out a lot. Right. But New York isn't for staying home. That's what's so cool about New York. I've always been fascinated by that lifestyle, too. So that's why I'm just so excited to interview you. So what what kind of advice would you give to somebody who who felt the same way about New York as you did and that they were a musician who wanted to go ahead and try it? How would they what would you say would be? some key advice points that you would want them to know? My advice would be, first of all, to, if possible, come in with a little cushion of money. (laughs) Make yourself some money in the previous place so you're not going to absolutely starve when you get here because Mm -hmm. the jobs might not start lining up your first day here. So come with a little cushion, if possible. Um, I would also say put the word out before you get here. Call everyone you know and tell them you are making the move and do they have any advice for you. Um, It's a tricky question to say, would you be able to help me? Would you be able to give me any work or something like that? Because that puts the person who's answering in the position of either saying no or saying maybe or, or feeling accountable. And um, that's a feeling that uh, we don't absolutely love. Um, but, but to be just asked for advice, I think, implies that the person moving here would appreciate the work, would appreciate being kept in mind. And the message is sent just by, may I have your advice on this? So, um, so putting it out there to everyone, you know, and not just your friends, but people who are friends of friends and colleagues of friends and just, just a a little email. Um, I think email is better than call actually. Um, but, but either one is okay. And then when you actually move here, do it again, follow up, say I'm here. Um, and I would still appreciate you, um, keeping me in mind if you have any more advice to give. Um, And then I would say, go ahead and accept any possible work, even the freebies, even doing something for free or for $20 is a way to meet people. And meeting people is the way to get work in New York. You meet them, you impress them in some way. And maybe at the last minute they need somebody to sub for them or they need somebody to present something with them or who knows, but meeting people is the way to go. Showing up at concerts, introducing yourself, um, telling the performers how much you admired what they just did. Um, that sort of thing, joining the local union, the union, at least in New York has pretty frequent seminars that, um, that address new musicians and how to break into various uh, venues. At, well, not venues, but avenues, let's say. Um, yeah. <laughs> don't want to break into a venue. Um, <laughs> so um, it's just about being humble, but being out there and somehow letting people know how good you are 
in a very humble way and being very nice. That's also yeah. key. Being nice. Yeah. Because working with somebody is so much more than just how you play too, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It is. Nobody Do you like it? Do you, you like it if someone says, hey, Susie, can I come and play for you? Would that be, could I have a lesson? Could I play a um, People list? do that. People do that. And um, I'm always happy to hear somebody play. Um, it, it could result in my passing their name along for certain things. And it, um, I, I, it always has. The people who've played for me uh, – have been wonderful violinists and I, I'm happy to pass their name along um, for certain things. I, I'm not the most successful freelancer <laughs> in New York, but I've been around for 11 years at this point and some things I can't do um, and some things I would prefer not to do because at this point I have a certain standard of what I will work for in terms of money. And if it's less than that and um certain colleagues of mine feel the same, then I might say to this person asking, you know, that's not enough for me, but I have some names for you of people who've just moved to town and, and might jump at something like this. Um, right. So, so that's certainly happened. Okay. Well, that seems like really great advice to me for sure. Um, and yeah, letting everybody know, even, even friends of friends, that's, that's great. That's great advice. Um, so, okay, well, I have two more questions for you, my wrap-up questions. Okay. And the first one is, what is uh, one habit or behavior you've de developed over the years that has made the most difference in your career so far? Hmm. A habit or behavior I've developed. Well, I would say... I don't know if it's, I guess it's made a difference in my career. Um, it's certainly made a difference in the way I feel. But as musicians, we are very critical of the way we perform. Sometimes a note that doesn't sound as great as it could, could ruin our day, could ruin our week. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and what I, what I've, learn to do and what I continue to learn to do is um, counsel myself after a performance where maybe there was one phrase or maybe one note or maybe a whole piece where I just didn't feel like myself and I don't think it came out as well as it should have, um, that I just try to look at things with perspective here. Um, even something that wasn't my absolute best is still good enough because how often am I at my absolute best? Um, hopefully some of the time, but not all the time. And I'm still doing fine and I'm still appreciated and I'm still hired. Um, so I, I always warm up uh, for a, an important performance or, or even an unimportant performance. Uh, every performance should be, considered important. <laughs> you know, we want to sound great at every performance, no matter whether if it's for, kindergartners or, or nursing home residents or a contractor that could give you better work or whatever. Um, you want to always go in warmed up and I do, um, and prepared of course. And then when it comes time to analyze how the performance went, I really try to, um, not take the bad and make that my, most memorable experience in the whole thing. I, I take it. I practice that part. I think, when am I going to get to perform this again? And, and how can I remedy it? But then I practice the rest of it. And I say, you know, this went well, and this went well. And I, I really do try to take the positive. And, um, and I tell myself that um, whatever went wrong is part of life, but the rest of it was a true representation of who I am. Nobody has my sound. Nobody has my vibrato. I showed them who I am and that's what I could do today. That's great. That's great. So often we really bog down and get 
dwelling on the worst thing that happened without thinking about all the other 99% of it that was awesome. So that's a really good practice, I think. Um, And the last question is, who in the classical world inspires you? And tell me why in one sentence. Yitzhak Perlman has been my inspiration since I learned about him as a small child. And why? Well, he has the most beautiful sound and vibrato. And this was a result not only of his talent, but of so many years and hours where maybe normal kids were outside playing ball and running around. He was in his house listening to Heifetz and practicing his Sevchik. And his gift is undisputable. But the hours that he put in, the work that he put in is also undisputable. And it's an incredible thing. The story behind him and the story he tells in his playing. So he is my inspiration. I love it. I love him too. He's great. And now I have to ask you, is undisputable the right word or is it indisputable? Um, I'm not sure. Is it un- in- indisputable? Uh, now I'm going to have to look it up. And if it's un, then I have to say that whole answer again. <laughs> <laughs> indisputable okay well that's the word let me see if undisputable is also a word because if it's not i gotta answer again (laughs) i don't want that going on the air undisputed undisputable okay let's see there's a undisputable versus indisputable um undisputable is a synonym okay i guess i'm fine Either or, interchangeable. That's great. (laughs) Phew. That's hilarious. Oh my gosh. Susie, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy New York day to come and talk to me about your amazing New York life. I'm so excited that I got to get that. That was so much fun to talk through. Thank you. Okay. And thanks everyone for listening to Crushing Classical and I'll see you next time. Bye.